this why gender is paramount thank you for uh your courage coming out to this a lot of people don't want to talk about this um you probably aren't going to hear sermons anywhere preached from the pulpit that are titled things like how to raise masculine sons and feminine daughters that's just not the topic uh that 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 definitely doesn't tickle people uh, people's ears now, many of you in this group might be wondering, Jared, why are we talking about this again? I mean, we always talk about this. Well, to be quite honest, the reason that we need to hear this, well, let me be personal, the reason I need to hear this is because I still need to grow. I have a lot of growing to do in my understanding and application of being a man of God. And my daughters, my wife, still have a lot they need to understand and grow in being women of God. And if I could be compassionate and yet honest and throw you under the bus with me, all of us in here, in this age of effeminacy, in this age of feminism, Mrs. Shippen, I don't like this because I can't see it, I'm gonna have to adjust. Oh, there we go, perfect. We're, did uh, you do that on purpose? Just, no, okay. I was seriously saying I'm, I'm watching you Okay, the video. Oh, the video, okay, well, it works for you. Um, in this age of effeminacy, in this age of feminism, in my opinion, and I don't think some people are over dramatic or, or they take things too far. They don't have a sense of proportion in history. I think this is accurate. I really do. In the history of Western Christianity or Christianity at large, let's even say Old Testament and New Testament church. This generation is the most feminist and effeminate generation in the history of the world. I know that might sound extreme. I would really love to be proved wrong, but I really just don't see it. It's been bad before, period of the judges, but nothing like what we got today. And, I, and I'm not picking on society. I'm picking on the church. And I'm picking on me. And uh, so that's why we're talking about this again, because this isn't, oh, well, I've seen this. I've heard this talk, so I'm good. No, hey, I've taught this talk more times than you'll probably ever hear it. I'm not good. I need to teach it again. I need to hear it again. That's why we're talking about this. This is the defining topic of multi-generational faithfulness and taking dominion in God's kingdom. Well, that was a mouthful. If you want to have multi-generational faithfulness, this is the topic you need to discuss. If you want to be a family in a church that takes dominion for the glory of God, like they are in Arizona, like they are in Moscow and all throughout the world and country, you need to get on with this and understand what this means. All right, so let's jump into it. Why talk about gender? Well, this is the battle of today. Uh, it's extremely foundational. It, does Satan have his crosshairs aimed at gender? Is gender one of his hot topics? Absolutely. Why? Because gender is powerful. Gender is incredible. Man, when you get... Men, a group of men that act like biblical men, that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. It's powerful. You get a group of women, young to old, wherever, acting like biblically feminine women, you better look out. They, they will change everything around them for the glory of God. I mean, this is, you know, we talk about how we're soldiers for Christ. These are the best weapons we have is biblical masculinity and biblical feminine, femininity, in my personal opinion. Uh, very, very foundational. Uh, Genesis 1, so God created man in, in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God made us in his image. The only distinction given is male and female. That's it. Not rich, poor, this side of the tracks, that. I mean, the, the only distinction is male and female. And friends, within those words, See, we're just used to this, so we take it for granted. Oh, yeah, male. Do you know what that means? I mean, really means, not just biologically, but metaphysically. What's sad is today, we need to explain to people what it means biologically, but I'm talking about metaphysically. The invisible qualities, the spiritual DNA of what it means to be a man. The physical is very linked to, to the uh, spiritual. My daughter, Eden, she's a girl, and guess what? There's an invisible part of her that is a feminine. It has a gender attached to it. Is Satan attacking gender? Yes. Why? Because it scares the tar of them. All the darkness in this world is somehow linked to this issue. Somehow. Uh, 
Is abortion linked to gender or the breakdown of gender? Sure it is. Behind abortion is a woman who doesn't know what it means to be a woman and a man that doesn't know what it means to be a man. Because biblical womanhood and manhood does not result in killing babies, um, poverty, prison, homelessness. If you want to know, you know, if you see a certain ethnic group uh, struggling more than another, it has nothing to do with skin color, racism. It has to do with fathers. The more there's no fathers, and the fathers might be present, but they're not being men. The more that fathers are gone, the more all that stuff gets crazy. Uh, does it affect a girl's life if she doesn't have a dad? Yeah. So welcome to, to teen pregnancy. Welcome to promiscuity. Welcome to all kinds of issues. Okay. Why does gender matter? Because it's a Genesis 1 creation. It's a very foundational. Here is... Here is my thesis I want to give you. And I believe this with all of my heart. And I love this truth because it's simple. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's simple to comprehend. And I need things simple. So here it is. This is the most, uh, um, probably the biggest statement that I want you to take away from this. The power of gender. If your only goal, now I'm not saying this should be your only goal, but just hypothetically, if your only goal as parents is to raise sons to be manly men, as defined by scripture, and to raise your daughters to be feminine women, as defined by scripture, you will succeed as parents. I believe it with all my heart. You say, well, I don't get that. I mean, okay, my boys are boys, and they, they want to be boys. My girls are girls. How's that going to? No, no, no. Raise them understanding what it means to be manly men as defined by the Bible. Let me give you a, a teaser trailer. Uh, I talked to a young man. I talked to the young men here. I say, hey, you're Christian. Yeah. Do you want to be a biblical man? Yes, Mr. Dodd, I do. Okay, that means you're going to be pure. Because that's biblical masculinity. That means you're going to show honor and deference to mom, to sisters, and to girls at large. That means you're going to be disciplined. That means you're going to be well kept. That's what it means to be a man. It doesn't just mean to, to just be male. It means there's... There's attitude, there's characteristics, there's behavior, there's manners, there's life purpose that's attached to it. Now, I showed you guys this triangle a couple weeks ago, right? Okay? So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to re, uh, repeat myself, but I hope you remember that at the bottom, you know, we have covenant with God. This is where the, the, the son or daughter at four comes and says, what am I going to be when I grow up? What am I going to do with my life? This is the answer. This is 95% of it. Well, whether you're male or female, we're, we're praying that you're in covenant with God. That's why God made you. God made you to be in covenant with him. That's why we're here, to be in covenant with God and to glorify him. Now, at the top up there, there's a unique calling. And that might be a vocation. That might be a ministry. That might be a relationship, whatever it is. But friends, the great omission in the church today, some, most Christian parents just talk about the top. Okay, well, do you want to be an attorney, doctor, or a preacher? Oh, there's a great joke about the mom who wants to know whether her kid's going to be, what is it? It's a preacher. Do you guys want to hear a joke real quick? Okay, so a mom is praying for a son, and she goes, I just don't know what, what he's going to be. She's praying that he's a preacher, and she puts out a Bible. Uh, she, she thinks he might be a banker. I'm going to butcher this joke. She puts out a dollar. Am I getting this right? Do you know, Jared, this joke? Okay, tell me if I mess up. And, she's a fr and, and she wonders if he's going to be a... Uh, Drinker or a glutton or what is it with the alcohol? Did she put out this? Gambler. Gambler. Okay, so is he going to be a gambler? Is it a banker? Mm -hmm. A banker or a preacher? So in the morning gets up and she puts these three things on the table, and he comes out, takes a swig of the alcohol, puts the money in his pocket, grabs the Bible, walks off, and she says, "Lord have mercy, he's going to be a politician." <laughs> <coughs> Thanks for all, Jared. Now, most parents just focus on the top. Now, some parents will say, okay, you know, lawyer, doctor, whatever, but we also want you to walk with God. But very few of us, and this isn't to blame. I'm not pointing the blame. This is, I mean, if not for the grace of God, I wouldn't see this. But because it's just not taught. The pastors are the ones who are going to give an account more than anyone. But very few people talk about gender. What am I supposed to do? Well, hey, it's pretty obvious. God made you a boy. 
And that's awesome. And that means you're destined to be a man. And to provide and protect and lead and shepherd and sacrifice. God made you a girl. That's awesome. Attached to that is to be a nurturer, to be a supporter, to be a wife and a mother. It's beautiful. We talked about this. I'm going to skip this. We talked about this last week or a couple weeks ago. So what's the goal? The goal is to raise our boys to be as, as biblically masculine as possible. Uh, by the way, that's a bad word today. Masculinity. They talk about toxic masculinity. If, if those who hate God don't like the word, they put things like toxic in front of it, right, to make it bad. And I loved when that phrase was going around. There was a meme of a bunch of guys like storming Normandy, maybe, and it was like, oh, here's toxic masculinity at work. I mean, hey, that's the greatest generation. I mean, the men who stormed those beaches, tangent, I can't help it. They've gone back, and this was about a decade ago. Actually, this was two decades ago. Because the World War II generation is almost gone. Like, the soldiers are almost gone. But they went back and they visited Iwo Jima, which, which that was really hard fighting, with these veterans. And the Christian man who was doing the interview asked him, he said, what would you feel about going back to that day and having some of your fellow women in the 1940s storm that beach with you? And the men didn't know. This. They were just, the question just offended. They were like, who would ever think of such a thing? But in the days we live in, in the day of uh, equality, a faulty kind of equality, that's what people think. And those men said, absolutely not. So masculinity is a fine word. It just means to be what you are, a man. If you're a man, you need to be manly. You need to play the part of a man. You need to act like a man. But not according to Hollywood, not according to evolutionism, according to the Bible. That's what we call biblical masculinity. The goal also is to raise our girls to be as biblically feminine as possible. That means womanly. That means, okay, you're a woman. You need to act like a woman. Womanly. You turn the noun into an adjective. Now, there are three ways to respond to God's order. The most popular one is to reject it. Forget that. And this is how many, I mean, this is how most, I mean, much of society... Are there people in the church who do this when it comes to gender in the Bible? In the lowercase c church, sure. Yeah, actually, there's churches, that's what they take pride in. Uh, I spoke up at the North Dakota Homeschool Convention last month, I think it was, and the keynote speaker, and I'm sure, every, I mean, I'm sure he was a great guy and said great things, but something he said that I disagree with is he said, we just need to take the idea of patriarchy and just throw it aside. And someone told me that after I did a session that I had a full room of 200 people saying, it's patriarchy or death, y'all. And the guy came up and said, just so you know, the keynote guy just said that we need to, I'm like, sorry, I didn't know that, but I'm not ashamed of what I said because, so obviously perhaps, you know, we have to see how people define it. Maybe he had a faulty definition. Patriarchy comes from the world word pater, which, we're, which is where we get father. It means for dads to be the head of the house. And to provide and protect and lead and guide and sacrifice. Do we need to get rid of that? Absolutely not. That's what we need. That's the issue. So you can either reject it or, now the second option is very popular in Christian, in Christian circles. Accept it as true but inwardly despise it. Now this is a spectrum. There's men and women who... 85% of them is like, okay, yeah, it's good. I know it's there, but 15, or maybe it's 50 50. Maybe it's 95 5. But this is the person who at least is Christian enough to say, look, I can't deny it. I know it's in the Bible. It's even in the New Testament, so it has to be for today. But, Jared, just between you and me, I don't like it. Now, if you say that you've never been there, you might be deceiving yourself. Feminism has done its work in all of us. All of us most likely have looked at what God says about men and especially women and said, I just don't like it. And I've had wonderful Christian men and women in this county say to me, Jared, I know the New Testament says that, but the next verses after that talk about slavery. So, just gonna, you know, we're just going to throw that whole thing out. And that's why we've taught in this group about the truth about slavery and what the Bible says. Uh, this is dangerous. Jesus said this, if anyone is ashamed of my words, I will be ashamed of him. Guys, either God knows what he's talking about or not. Either his word is true or he's not. And people today, they want the salvation, but they don't want what he says. 
Third option, accept it as true and embrace it. This is what it means to have a biblical worldview. I think I said this in, in the last lesson. God hands us a Bible. He says, group that meets at Lou's, the church at Lou's house. Take a pen, take some scissors, change what you want to change, and I as God will change it. Many church groups would love that opportunity to say, sweet daddy, hey, God has heard our prayers. And they would rip out the Old Testament. They would get rid of, they, they would even change some of the red words according to the debate I went to last month. But to have a biblical worldview, you'd say, God, I'm not changing one jot or tittle because your word is perfect. Friends, God made us male and female. And in Genesis chapter one, he creates, and two, he creates distinction. He creates roles. Either he didn't know what he was talking about or it's really good. And what I want to challenge us all with is if you believe that God's word works, apply it to this. What God says about what it means to be male and female, what God says about what it means to be husband and wife, father, mother, son, daughter, it works and it's beautiful and it's powerful. It's just like the doctor's orders. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to suffer for it. And so this is where the rubber meets the road. We can say that we believe the Bible, but this is where we need to put our practice where our mouth is and put it into practice. Does this make sense? Any questions or comments on this? All right, once again, this is just kind of introduction. If you're a son, your number one goal needs to be to learn how to be a man. Sons, read this, please. You need to know how to think like a man. You need to know how to speak like a man, how to act like a man. Learn skills that accompany manhood. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 16 maybe, 16, 13, it says act like men. That's in the Bible. Act like men. What skills do young men have these days? Downloading, Downloading pornography. That would be 50% of all Google searches, by the way. Phones, texting, video games. Microwave. Microwave. <laughs> <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Wait, of course I can cook. I can't cook? Watch this popcorn, two and a half minutes. Oh. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, sons, I have homework for you. I want you to talk to your oldest relative. Hopefully your grandparents are still alive. And I want you to ask them what their parents and grandparents were able to do when they were your age. And it will be a very insightful conversation. We underestimate our children. And Thomas Jefferson, what, no, not, well, Thomas was doing amazing things, why not? Alexander Hamilton was 12, he was running a mercantile shop by himself on the island of St. Croix in two different languages. And it wasn't because he was, I mean, this isn't de-evolution. It's not like we're, I mean, we are kind of evolving downward, unfortunately, but we're made out of the same stuff they were. We just got to put our mind and our heart and soul to practice. We underestimate ourselves. If you're a daughter, your number one goal, daughters, pay attention, please, needs to be to learn how to be a woman. Just because you're a girl, you don't automatically, this is something has to be taught. You know it's crazy. Uh, we have a book published in 1904 called... How to be a, no, it's not how to be a woman. Skills that all women should know, I can't remember. I think it's how to act like a woman. And it's so cute because she goes through how to host a dinner party, how to, I mean, there were rules. Now, these rules are very cultural at times, but like girls knew when they came up to a puddle how to, how to, how to navigate. They knew how to speak to people. They knew the correct responses. They knew how to act. I mean, this is where men used to bow and girls used to curtsy. Now, we don't have to do, do that today. That's cultural. But the culture reflected biblical truth, and it was beautiful. How to think like a woman, how to speak like a woman, how to act like a woman, learn skills that accompany womanhood. Uh, did you know that there's much overlap in the skills of men and women and the way they speak? But men and women aren't supposed to talk always the same way. They aren't supposed to always act the same way. They certainly aren't supposed to dress the same way. Their activity, even though 90% is overlap, there's some things that are very unique. You know, people laugh when 20 years ago I'd say, like, for instance, I don't give birth. And they'd be like, oh, of course we all know that, but check out what you have today. You have men that are trying really hard. It's not, they're never going to figure it out, right? Uh, what, lady, uh, what skills do young ladies have today? What would be some good skills for them to have? Anyone want to throw something on? Cooking. 
Cooking. People are always afraid to say that because they think, because feminists would gasp. Cooking? Oh gosh, they're prehistoric. Hey, guess what? My wife, she's been a mama for a while. Guess what happens every day in our home, two to three times? People eat. Guess who gets the food ready most of the time? Mama. Do you want to eat good food? Food's pretty cool. Learn how to cook. I spoiled rotten. And my kids are spoiled also. My, my wife's a good cook. All right, let's jump into the meat of this. Let me talk about four killers of masculinity. Uh, I don't have it in this teaching. Forgive me. I just realized I have another teaching that has five killers of femininity, and I forgot it. Maybe it'll come to me and I'll think of some of it, but I forgot to put it in this teaching. All right, four killers of masculinity. Picture's worth a thousand words, isn't it? You look at that picture now, am I saying it's wrong to lay on a couch? No. But it's the spirit of the age. You know the priority of many boys is to do just enough to get by so they can get back to being lazy? Killer one, a love for entertainment. Nothing wrong with entertainment. I think we should resurrect some old school forms of entertainment. Uh, would you agree, though, that we have a very disproportionate addiction to entertainment as a culture? Like, our life revolves around entertainment, right? Uh, you don't go to church every day. That would, that would be cultish. But watching the big tube each day, no problem, right? So, entertainment. Nothing wrong with it, but it's an addiction. And it follows us everywhere. And we're just plugged into this matrix. <coughs> Number two, peer-based relationships, adolescence. There's nothing wrong with hanging out with people your age. But if that, is, if that is a very continual practice, it doesn't yield maturity. It's not like, you know what? I really want my eight-year-old Joe to grow up. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get around with a bunch of 10-year-olds all day and just let them go off and do what they do, and that'll grow them up. It's just, there's nothing wrong with hanging out with people your age. But if you want to grow up, sons and daughters, hang at Okay, this is gonna sound really weird. If you guys wanna grow up faster than maybe you're on schedule for, hang out with older people. It's pretty weird. But hang out with older people. Hang out with dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts. Get some of the men or women in your church. Tell them, go up to a man in your church that you respect and ask him to teach you, and let's say he's skilled as a mechanic or a hunter. Whatever it is, ask him to teach you. You'd be amazed. You can grow up really quick. It's a powerful thing. And I would spend more time on that, but I've got a lot to present to you, and I want to honor your time. Okay, this is a big one. Is that a big one? You guys, this for me could be a whole talk. Actually, I think we're going to, in this boot camp, probably do a whole talk on this. And Trey's going to help me. But this is, this is the elephant in the culture right now. Like, this is the elephant in the culture. Uh... You look, at, you look at men out there that do crazy things, like uh, Ted Bundy, was that his name? Uh, or, well, I'm not gonna name any other names, but there are, there, are, there are men out there who have made really bad, heinous, horrible decisions, and guess what it comes back to? It's crazy, it comes back to this. It comes back to an addiction that rewired their brains. Guys, Hey, adults, aren't you glad they didn't have internet and smartphones when we were kids? And yet, this is, you know, this is where we're at. So we don't need to go Amish. We need to learn how to deal with it. Teach their own for me. My kids don't have smartphones. They have dumb phones that only call and text. But to text, you have to push the button three times to get the letter you want. It's great. They're never on their phone because it just annoyed them. They tried for like five minutes, like, forget it. This thing's, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about lust some more in a bit. That's a big one though. Let me just say this to the young men and the young women, especially the young men. Um, and obviously I, I wanna speak with sanctified language because we have people of all ages. Actually, let me speak to parents. Parents, you need to talk to your kids about this. And I know you as I look around this room that you do, but this is the one thing that absolutely ruins. You know, with my work, I get to go around and see these amazing young men and women and I see poster child young men get betrothed or engaged to a woman, but there's a secret sin that no one knows about, and it ruins everything. 
it's a big deal. It's a big deal. This is the uh, dragon that is devouring our children. And last, laziness. Once again, that's, it's like we're just prodding. We have a generation that they do the bare minimum. They check the boxes so they can go back to just being entertained, hanging out with their friends, lusting, being lazy, whatever it is. And that is, that, this is the spirit of the age. And forgive me, I don't remember the five killers of femininity. I could guess, but I don't remember. I forgot to put it in here, but maybe I'll mention that next week. All right, I just want to put up a quote for you. This is going to lust, and uh, I think this is going to be pretty insightful. <coughs> Our mission is to create a culture where all people can pursue pleasure. Now, that is the mission statement of a certain organization that I'm not going to mention because I don't want to, but it's one that is about adult entertainment, okay? And that's their mission statement. And I saw this in the wall in San Antonio in the mall when I took Joe to his right of passenger just sitting there <laughs> and had a logo under it. Our mission, this is their mission. And it's kind of cool that they put it out there because there's no hiding it. Like, this is their agenda. Besides making a lot of money and being evil and gratifying the flesh, to create a culture where all people can pursue pleasure. Now, guys, you're about to connect a, when was um, Aquinas? See the 1200s? Yeah, okay. You're going to connect about a thousand year gap right now. Because I'm going to put up a definition of effeminacy that was given by Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s. Now, effeminacy, most of us think of, you know, it's acting like a, a guy that acts girly. But uh, Aquinas, a thousand years ago, this is where we need to listen to our forefathers. Aquinas gave an amazing definition almost a thousand years ago, and here it is. And see how it connects with that mission statement. Effeminacy, preferring pleasure over doing what is right, strenuous, or difficult. Now, now that's a paraphrase of his definition but that captures the essence of it. Men, young men, look at me. Effeminacy is probably a word you aren't used, aren't used to. It means for a guy to act girly. But what it really means is for a guy to see what he's supposed to do and who he's supposed to be, but avoid it because he just wants to gratify his flesh. That could be staying in bed. You know, that could be you know you should get up, but you're like, no. Nah. Oh, I just want to sleep. That's being effeminate. Knowing, knowing that you should step in and help someone be like, ah, I just don't want to do that. That's being effeminate. Uh, I think I mentioned this a couple, a couple weeks ago, but when I'm talking to a young lady and Christian lady, she's like, yeah, that Christian boy likes me. I don't know, maybe, but he, you know, he's, trying to, he's trying to convince me to do things we shouldn't do. I say, avoid him like the plague. He's effeminate. That's not manly. Because guess what it means to be a man? It means if you have regards for a, a woman, to practice 1 Timothy 5, 2, which says to treat her like a sister with absolute purity. See, Hollywood would say that that's being a man, going around and doing things with girls. That's not being a man. That's being a wimp. That's being a coward. That's being someone who needs to get the crud kicked out of them, if I can just be transparent. Do you see the connection? All right, what does it mean to be a man? We're going to talk about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. Tie this up with a pretty bow. What does it mean to be a man? Five things. First of all, it means to be strong. It means to be strong. Now, this is not physical strength. You guys probably thought so looking at me teaching this, you know. You're like, huh, I know where Jared's going. Actually, that guy's pretty strong right there, man. Football player. Those football players. Hey, I played football. Burn it, dude. Coach Abernathy, I played football. Yeah. Started my junior year. Tight end, outside linebacker on JV. That's right, junior year. They needed me to come down and inspire the young people, and I did. Took one for the team. Had a good year. Also batted 527 that year in baseball. I'm serious, 527 on JV. On JV. Senior year of special teams. Yeah, that's right. Special teams, because I was special. <laughs> as a senior. That's what that means. My dad's in the World Baseball Fame. I didn't get the gene. I was adopted, but whatever. Robert. Be strong. Watch ye. 
Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. That's King James language for act like men. Be strong. Last time I taught this was with people that only like the King James, so it's going to be really King Jamesy. This is Solomon. He, he's talking to, no, this is David talking to Solomon. He goes, I'm about to go the way of the whole earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself to be a man, keeping the doctrine of the Lord your God, walking his ways, keeping his statutes. What does it mean to be a man? It means to be strong in the Lord. It means to be godly. Hey, boys, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer out loud, but I'm going to guess what you're going to answer. Do you want to marry an amazing godly woman? Okay. Newsflash. I'm guessing you say yes. Why don't you just give me a head nod? You want to marry an amazing godly woman? Okay. <laughs> amazing godly women only marry amazing godly men. And amazing godly men are strong in the Lord. They love God. I know some of you guys well enough to know that you're studs in the eyes of ladies. You can shoot hoops. That's cool. You can shoot however much under par. I don't know which one of you guys it is, but one of you guys. Yeah, him. So just incredible. And that's great. I wish I could do that. And that's great. I'm not criticizing that at all, but in our culture, girls look at that, which is cool. And they go, ooh, and you know, that's cool. That's good. But guess what? You really want to win hearts? Follow God. Love God. When I went to Bible school, I told you this guy's a story, but I'm going to tell it again. Our Bible school is called New Tribes Bible Institute. We nicknamed it New Tribes Bridal Institute because everyone got married all the time. I barely survived in that place, got out and married my wife, Amy. But uh, when I first went there, and it's just, it's such a pain being single. I'm so glad I'm married. Being single is so annoying because everywhere you go, every girl used to be like, oh, I wonder if she might be the one or if she might be the one. And of course, in Bible school, goodness gracious, you're like, I'm going there, I'm gonna get married. And you're looking you're like, oh, she's good. Oh, that's gross. Okay, I'm putting her on the list. And, she, and there were some girls I walked in, I was like, man, she is beautiful. She's okay, but she's beautiful. And I got to know them and I saw their light shine. I was like, wait a minute. She's okay. She's beautiful. Do you see how that changes? I mean, when you see that light shine, there's girls who I might have thought, yeah, she's, I mean, she's cute. But goodness gracious, when I got, once I got to know her, something happened. I was like, that's one of the most beautiful women I've seen because of this. Well, this is for guys, but the same thing for girls. I mean, she was strong in the Lord. She loved God. Be strong, men. What does it mean to be a man? It means to honor and protect women. This is the chivalric or chivalric code. Um, this is uh, the cry on the Titanic, women and children first. This is being a knight in shining armor. Ladies, without feminism, can you, can you agree that you want a knight in shining armor? Are you okay with that? I mean, if girls are honest, yeah, I want a knight in shining armor. Men, you can be that. Well, Actually, you can't. You need Jesus. But Jesus in you, you can be that with Christ. Honor and protect women. It's beautiful. It's awesome. When you honor and protect women, women, when men honor and protect you, it doesn't make you weak. It makes you beautiful, special, and awesome. See, the lie of feminism, there are girls I know who do not want to be treated as special. I told you a story about the woman I pulled over and helped her with her tire, and she was very frustrated. She's like, oh, I do not like this because of feminism. Or, hey, can I get that for you? No, I can get it myself. You think I can't? See, when, sh when men honor women, what they're saying is you are the apex of creation. You're more important, special than I am. What does it mean to be a man? To provide. Oh, this is a big one in today's day and age. Man, our grandparents got this. Okay, I'm just gonna be transparent. Today, I was driving over here with my kids and we passed Walmart and there was a guy there with holding a sign. To his defense, I didn't read the sign. I could assume what it said. And sitting next to him was his wife and two little kids. Now, maybe I've got it all wrong and their car broke down and da da da, but you know what I'm talking about, right? What does scripture say? If any does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse off than an infidel, than an unbeliever. That's what the New Testament says. Let me say it again. If anyone doesn't provide for his family, it's talking about men. They have denied the faith. If I ask you, hey, what do you have to do to, to uh, deny the faith and be worse off than an unbeliever? 
The question can't be, be to not believe because that's just to be an unbeliever. This is worse than an unbeliever. Do you think God cares about men providing? Look at this verse. This is in the Bible. People don't know this. Goes on to talk about, by the way, that if, that, that, that if a man can't provide because he's crippled or he's sick or he dies or he leaves or whatever, that whose job is it to provide for the family if the man can't? Church. Do churches do that today? No, they force the women to get jobs and put their kids in government-run schools. 1 Timothy 5. Could it be that the government is emasculating men by being a false provider for the family? I think so. Biblically, the government has a specific role. It is not to provide. Let me ask you, does the government do a good job providing? No, because it wasn't ordained to. It was created, you know, this was created with a certain purpose. It can only do that purpose well. It doesn't make a good hammer, although sometimes I want to use it as a hammer, right? The government was, was created by its creator to protect people, not provide for them, not educate them, not medicate them. Government only does well. It wasn't, and this is a tangent, of course, but this is a big deal. Men, in this spirit of welfare, you need, you need to be a provider. You need to work. You need to learn how to work hard and work long and be skilled. Someone says, my boy's 12, what should I do? Go out somewhere and together with him work for 10 hours in the hot sun. Just get his body acquainted with being able to work. Any questions or comments on this? Shepherd your family. Oops, I don't have a verse for this one, but uh, Scripture speaks of wives asking their, question, uh, their husbands questions. Um, men, when you get married, you become a pastor. Oh, hey, this last Sunday, Amy and I celebrated 19 years of marriage. 19 years. And she said something I've never considered. She said, you know, this isn't just our anniversary. It's the birthday of our family. I was like, never thought of that before. That's pretty cool. Our family, you know, as far as me and her was born 19 years ago this Sunday, and we've been adding on, right? But it started with just me and her. And when we got married, I became a pastor. I was a pastor in a church, but I became a pastor in a more important role, a family. And we don't tell Christian men that today. Hey, you're getting married. You are a shepherd. Just as the government can cripple the masculinity of men providing, do you think maybe modern Christianity cripples uh, the masculinity of men in shepherding? And lastly, to be skilled. And those verses talk about how you need to be skilled. Work. Learn how to do things. Man, learning skills teach, uh, gives, gives a good kind of confidence. Guys, there are men today who, they don't know how to change an outlet. That's, I mean, they need help with everything. That's why they say that just ordinary handymen are going to be making six figures soon because no one knows how to do anything. Everyone needs stuff, you know, needs help. Okay, any questions or comments on what it means to be a man? Please. Amen. No, excellent point. Yeah, men need to step up and not, not be bullied, right? 
And that's where that's where God God is raising up and going to continue to raise up men who will start corporations who will like that might be you or your boys someday, right, Mr. Dodd? That's the same. That's the reason that your brother-in-law got out of the Navy. Oh yeah. If if we wanted you to have a family, we would have issued you one. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Their attitude. Yeah. It's not just the Navy; it's all the soldiers. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do what it takes, and that's where. That's where I've seen I've seen men take great sacrifices in changing vocations or whatever it takes to be the men, the leaders, the providers, the family men they need to be. Jared, real quick. Yes, ma'am. I, I got I got to meet my dad's cousin, which I knew years ago, but he's a master craftsman carpenter. And my sister does remodels in Dallas. And so she was telling him, which I didn't know this, but he he's very amazing. Like he's awesome at his craft. And he's done like really big, huge houses for famous people. But she told him, she said, now, if we want a master craftsman, we have to fly him in from New Jersey, New York. There's no master craftsman around here anymore. Crazy? It's, it's like a dead trade now. It's so mm -hmm. sad. Great, uh, great book I would just plug um, about trades is Durable Trades by Rory Groves durable trades and his ministry is all about the family economy and uh that's awesome it, it it's a great book because when things get hard economically many of the jobs people have today go away but guess what fixing stuff like plumbers electricians or people who raise livestock farmers those jobs stay but all these high level technical i mean those jobs are fine but they're not durable they don't survive the test of time all right, uh, let me run through some pictures. You guys have seen these before, but there were seen again. Okay, this is what it meant to be a man. You look on the left there, you have the family man. These guys, wife and kids. I mean, men, and guys, these men, many of them weren't born again, but they were more Christian than many born again Christians today are. They were excited about being men and providing and having a home. They, oh, there's this great quote by C.S. Lewis, and I'm just gonna paraphrase it, but he says, men today who are promiscuous want, they say they want a woman, but they don't understand that to have a woman, you need, um, I'm gonna butcher it, but to truly have a woman, you need to have a house to give her to thrive in. Like, it, does, does, does it make sense? It's, it's, it's not just having a woman to go on a date with and to be sinful with. I mean, you really wanna experience a woman? Give her a home, give her children, and watch her thrive in that context, that's a woman. So. It was, it's, it's something like that. Look it up, Uncle Clive. Okay, uh, we see the Titanic in the middle there and we see men working, that's a CCC, Conservation Corps, Civilian Conservation Corps in the Great Depression. Um, so we used to have this, we used to have, I mean, men working. Uh, these, were, these were young men, you go to the World War II era, you go to the Civil War era, and that 20% of the soldiers on both sides were minors, right? And uh, that's what it meant to work. And today, this is the vision of manhood, or of young, you know, this is the vision of young men. And once again, those four killers of masculinity are raised in this. One of the best verses for young men today is this. Uh, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, what did I do? I put childish ways behind me. It's time to grow up. You know, it'd be fascinating to take a poll. When is it time to grow up? Who knows what you'd hear? Biblically, this might be a stretch. I think you could argue, well, let me just ask you, what's the one story, okay, who is the most important figure to follow in the Bible? Jesus, if you never know the answer in Christianity, it's gonna be Jesus, okay? <laughs> the Bible gives us one snapshot at a certain part in his upbringing. How old was he? Hey, you're 12? It's time to... Really, it's before you're 12, because by the time you're 12, you're supposed to be acting this way. You're 10, 11. Job, Job's 10. Hey, it's time for him to start, you know, it's time for me to start expecting him to act like a 12-year-old pretty soon. And he needs to grow. He needs to man up. It's time to put childish ways behind him. Act like a man. That's the expectation. And guys, once again, if we don't put that expectation on our kids, we're putting a different expectation, and they're going to walk in that. Some people are like, I just don't know why my kids, well, what are you expecting of them? Right? Women and children first. We'll talk about that in a bit. 
man, I love this story of the Titanic. If you don't know the story, don't watch the movie. I've never watched the movie. But I've had people that have friends that have watched the movie. Is it fair to me to say don't watch the movie? Anyone who watched the movie can say maybe don't watch the movie? I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of inact. They didn't focus on a lot of stuff they should have. Read good books on the Titanic. Titanic's an amazing story. Amazing story. I'll talk about it in a bit because I can't help it. Well, you had men, men that weren't born again, but they thought like Christians, giving up seats for women and children first. Today, that's an article. It's a picture in an article of a woman who was uh, working a couple of jobs, pregnant, very tired, on a subway, and she asked a man for his seat, and he said, absolutely not. I'm, giving, I'm not giving you my seat. You're the one that chose to get pregnant. I'm tired, too. And guess what? In an evolutionary worldview, he's right. Why should I give up my seat for you? What's the difference? We're both just pond scum that's evolved. And hey, survival of the fittest. You want the seat? Take it. I wish I could have been on that subway with like all the men here. We wouldn't have beat them up. That wouldn't have been Christian. But we would have given them a talking to and preached a sermon and said, hey, this is what evolutionism gets you. This is what modernism gets you. Guy should be ashamed of himself. Oh, this is the best one. You guys know what's coming. You've seen this slide before. Here it is. There's the man. All right, drum roll. This is what it used to be. Oh, wait, wait. Emily says, this is what it used to look like to be a man, leader, protector, provider, shepherd, patriarch, responsible, loved wife, loved children. Bodhi Bakum talks about being the shepherd, the priest, the provider, the protector. And what does it look like today? Drum roll. Come on. Drum roll. Here we go. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying if, 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 if you have a small dog or not. I'm not saying. <laughs> but have you ever noticed you drive into Austin, you start walking around, you see a lot of guys walking these little dogs. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to pick them like, dude, is that where it's at? But you can't say, it's okay if you have a small dog, and then say five minutes of it's not okay if you have a small dog. <laughs> what was your dog's name? Taco? Biscuit. Biscuit. <laughs> Biscuit was a good dog, dude. Biscuit, Biscuit was a good dog. But I'm more of a man now. Yes, you're more of a man. Dude. No, seriously, it's okay to have a small dog, but do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, did you know that um, daycare centers are going down and pet care centers are going up? Random but kind of connected. You know there's more adult diapers sold in Japan than baby diapers? They're not having kids. I got some stats coming in a bit. Things might be coming this way as far as that goes. This fifth. is the new image of manhood and responsibility. That's your fifth. That's your fifth killer of masculinity. That's right. Is, uh, skinny jeans. Skinny jeans. Thank you. <laughs> Can't stand them. Uh, there's so much we can talk about that, but we just don't have the time. All right, guys, this is a picture of the Birkenhead. 1845, the Birkenhead was selling from Scotland or from Great Britain down a, a, a around uh, Africa, the coast. 634 people were aboard, 441 people died. They hit a reef, they floundered, they started sinking, they sink in 20 minutes. The captains brought out the soldiers and they said, look, we're sinking, we've got about 20 minutes. There's sharks encircling us. We have only enough room on, on the lifeboats. Um, did I say how many women were on board? There were 125 women and children on board. 125 wives and children of some of the crew. And uh, they said, uh, look, we only have enough room for the women and children. If you take up that room or if you try it, the boats will capsize, we'll lose our, our women and children. So we're gonna play the British national anthem. You're gonna stand at attention and you're, and you're gonna go down the ship. And guess what? They did. It's called the Birkenhead Drill. Some of them survived and they wrote this great poem called the Birkenhead Drill. And I. I should tell it to you sometime because the guy at the end, he says, I'll change the words of it. He goes, it's a tough, darn pill to swallow, something like that. But he said, but, well, let me just say what happened. Nine, uh, 193 survived, 68 men, 125 women and children. All of the women and children survived. They, they did not lose one woman. They lost about, what would that be, 400 men? They did not lose one woman or child. And this guy writes this thing called the Birkenhead Drill. Then he goes, but all the women and children survived, and for that, for that reason, I can rest in peace. There's a story about one of the boats not having a woman apt to man it, 
and they got this private, he was 19 years old, they said, man this, don't turn around. He said, yes sir, he got in, started rowing. The dad of this wife and children are in the sea, and they see him, they say, go, go, that's our husband, that's our daddy, and he goes, no, I have motors, go, go. And the guy finds this 19-year-old private, I think his name was Nichols, I, I, I need to learn this because I tell a story all the time. He turns the boat around, starts going. This is in the book, uh, Amazing Tales for Making Men Out of Boys. And um, the husband sees the family come, he says, no, go away, go away. The 19-year-old jumps in, grabs the dad, swims him over, puts him in the boat, says, get him out of here, takes about 10 strokes, get ta gets taken down by a shark. That's what it means to be a man. This story was told in every classroom in America. Teddy, Ro uh, Teddy Roosevelt, as a young child, wrote this story down on his chalk tablet. The king of Bohemia had his soldiers come out on the anniversary of this every year and stand at attention and, and hear the story because this is what it meant to be a man. Fast forward 50 or so years. Oh, ah, okay, let's talk about this. Scratch that. Ah, actually, I'm going to do these out of order. Oh, the Titanic's not here. I must have accidentally deleted it. Let's talk about the Titanic. Fast forward to 1912, you have the Titanic. There were 1,500 people on the ship. Uh, no, 1,500 people died, 1,300 of them roughly were men. Almost all the people who died were men. Uh, you had 60 cabin boys, 16 years of age, that went on that boat to get a free trip over. They worked as cabin boys, 60 of them. All 16 years old, all of them died. They stood there and they all went down with a ship. Man, I had this script in my line for a movie called Women and Children First. I just think it'd be an amazing movie. I need to write it down and get someone here to give it to someone because it'd be amazing. These are the kind of films that we need to make. Um, you had men in the coal room, right? They generated, they used the coal to generate the electricity to keep the boat alit. And they came down, they said, look, here's the deal. We're taking on water. We're going to sink. Every second you give us save, saves lives. Those men turned, shook hands, and they all died because they shoveled in the coal until the last second. You have the richest man in the world, John Jacob Astor. They, let, they, they saved the last seat on the last lifeboat for this man because they said, sir, so much depends on you. And he said, okay, fine. And he was getting on the last, I mean, they, they had just, I mean, it was cram packed full of the last lifeboat. They had this one spot left, and then they said, wait, 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 and they had found this one woman who was a washerwoman, some foreign washerwoman, lower class, and he said, give her the place. His body would be found days later floating in the ice fields. Richest man in the world. He was in his 20s. His uh, wife and either young daughter or pregnant in the womb was on that boat. You had a man named Archibald Butt, like H-E-B, and he was there. He was someone special, and uh, I can't remember what his role was, but he was talking to a woman who was the music teacher for some president or something. There were famous people. I mean, this was, there were, there were famous people. You had movie stars giving up their seats. Well, I don't know if they were movie stars, actors or performers giving up their seats for women and children first. And uh, some guy tried to get on him. He grabbed him and pulled him back and he said, women and children will, will, will be first or else I'll break every bone in your body. Some great quote like that. Now, there was a guy, as you've heard me tell you, that said, no, I really want to make it. So he went down. This is so ironic in the times we live in. And he went down into a cabin. He put on a dress, a bonnet, and snuck on board as a woman. They found out about it later. And you can read this quote, look it up, of them saying, this man exists. This man is a cur. He exists only to be an example of what it does not mean to be a man. 1912. Okay, the Burgoyne happened in between the two. This was a French ship. And so this, these were the sons and daughters of the French Revolution, right? Equality, right? Equality that's not the equality of God. You had 726 people on crew, men, women, children. Only 173 people survived. 110 of them were crew, 62 were traveling men, one woman survived. There were over 100 women and children. One, 50 children died. Why? Because the men were up. It was each man for himself getting up, harpooning women and children and, and other men off. It was horrible. It was an embarrassment. I mean, France, France carried so much shame for this. But guess what? Ideas have consequences. It's a great experiment to compare French Revolution, American Revolution. Not at all alike. And then compare Titanic with the Burgoyne. No children survived. You need to be a man. Men, are you a knight in shining armor or are you a lazy, lustful 
bum in the making. The chivalric code was birthed out of Christianity. If you're a Christian, look, to be a Christian male and not be biblically man, manly is a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. Okay, I'm sorry. I've spent too much time. I'm just going to go through these really quick. Um, to be a woman, forgive me, we spent more time on, on, on men. Women are just as important, obviously. It means to be glad you're a girl. The most beautiful girls I know are young ladies I talk to. I'm like, so you're a girl? I'm like, yeah, really excited about it. Can't wait to be a wife. Can't wait to be a mama. Most, hey, hey, moms who have sons. Moms who have sons. That's just about every mom in here. Do you want your boy to marry a girl that's either excited about being an independent career woman or really excited about being a wife and a mom? It's pretty, it's pretty easy, isn't it, right? Because that's, that's beautiful, right? That's beautiful. It means to be beautiful, and I'll just paraphrase this. It says that beauty, true beauty is godliness, man. When girls are godly, they are beautiful. Now, every girl's beautiful because they're made in the image of God, but there is a high, look, God put a desire for inside of girls to be pretty. That's from God. Now, the world perverts that with eating disorders, all this, but for a girl to want to be beautiful, that's good. Never, ever. I've had parents get this tragically wrong where they think it's selfish or worldly for the girl to want to be pretty. No. Now, what is feminism doing? It's making girls suppress their beauty and ruin themselves, right? No, being beautiful is awesome. It means to be skilled. It means to find joy in fulfilling the vision of your man, whether that's dad, whether that's husband. Uh, many females, few women. Pictures worth a thousand words. Um, there's a story I was going to tell about this. Look, I'm not saying that if a girl has a job or if a girl wants to do something like that, there's anything wrong with it. All I'm saying is this, just food for thought. I think being a wife and a mom's a full-time job. That's my opinion. It takes a lot of work. Now, can you also, with your family, do great things, whether it's education, whether it's mission work, whether it's family business? Absolutely. But the sad thing is we have a culture that more and more esteems career over motherhood. Does that make sense? I'm not saying we need to get wrong, rid of one or the other. Well, definitely not rid of the one on the left. But I think you guys know what I'm saying for time to speed on here. Oh, I've got a great stat. I didn't know what to compare with this picture, so I just did that. I'm not saying I have an issue with dogs. I'm not trying to pick on dogs. Dogs are great, but I just didn't know what else to do. But isn't it funny? I mean, why are people so obsessed? Would you agree there's a huge obsession with pets right now? Okay. There's nothing wrong with pets. There's nothing wrong, wrong with animals. I mean, Genesis 1, we, we were made to be involved with animals and do things. But there's a reason why, and this is why. To have a pet like you, you don't have to change. You don't have to change. You can be as selfish, sinful, self-centered, whatever, and that pet will still wag its tail or whatever, purr or whatever it is. Okay, here's a stat. Forty-five percent of women between ages twenty-five to forty-four will be childless by twenty thirty. Actually, I'm sorry, I didn't do that quote right. Single and childless by twenty thirty. That's seven years away. Forty-five percent. They will instead devote their lives to a career and a boss that truly don't care for them. And pets. And pets. <laughs> they will engage in sinful promiscuity which will lead to mental issues. God didn't make us to do that. God didn't make us to live that way. Guys, the bedrock of society is the nuclear family. The bedrock of society. The bedrock of society. From Adam and Eve up until 1890, even the pagans got it right. It was family. Everyone was about family. Everyone, I mean, even, even Sodom and Gomorrah, even the people in the days of Noah times understood male, female, marriage, boom. Family, roles. Oh, you already talked about obsession with pets. <laughs> oh, this is tangent, but I can't help it. Do you know why women... Okay, let me just ask you. Why do women always dress the most feminine at their weddings? 
why do women always dress? Well, first, let me not make an assumption. Would you agree that women usually dress the most feminine at their weddings? Why? It's the day that their gender is highlighted. True. And to add on that, it's because it's the one day in their life that they want to be the most beautiful. Think about it. Why do women dress the most feminine on their wedding day? There's some women that never dress feminine, but on their wedding day, they're going to be feminine. Why? Because it's the one day that they want to be beautiful. Hey, has prom happened yet? Okay, it's coming up, right? It's coming up? Are any of the girls going to be wearing sweatpants to prom? <laughs> I'm just curious. Any, any, any of the boys going to be wearing short shorts to prom? Maybe. Probably. Nah, probably. Probably. I mean, think about it. Now, we're, we're, we'll, we'll avoid the fun topic of modesty and what they reveal. But I bet the girls are going to dress feminine because they want to be beautiful. All right, we got to wrap up. I was going to talk about democracy in America. We just don't have the time. Um, but I'll end with this. We need manly sons and feminine daughters as defined by scripture. And the conclusion, once again, if your only goal as parents is to raise your sons to be manly men, as defined by scripture, and raise your daughters to be feminine women, as defined by scripture, you will succeed as parents. Guys, I'm telling you, for me, this has been such an aid because at, being a parent is not easy, agreed? Being a parent's hard. It's all these, especially Christian parents who are involved in your kid's education. It's hard. There's all kinds of this, I mean, there's all this stuff to juggle. But man, if there's only one thing we get right, give your sons a vision for being men and give them the right heroes in the Bible and outside the Bible of being manly. And give your daughters, beautiful daughters, a vision for being women. And give them the right heroines, and you will set them up for success. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for giving us sons and daughters. They are beautiful, they are wonderful, and you have made them for such a time as this the cure, as always, is your gospel. And Father, attached with your gospel is, is male and female. You made us this way to take dominion for your name's sake. So God, I reject the spirit of this age, of feminism, of effeminacy, and pray that you would raise up a generation from amongst us right here of men and women of God. The enemy doesn't want it. Society doesn't want it. Unfortunately, modern Christianity doesn't want it. But you do. May we live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you. That's good.